All right, well, I guess I'll get started. Um, so thank you everyone for joining in. Um, and uh, I'll start by saying if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me um, at any time. If you think of questions after the fact, feel free to email me or anyone on our team. Um, we're happy to help you um, as you continue to, as, well, you start thinking about actually um, uh, possibly using Nurse Spec and in particular um, the MSA. So I'm going to I'm going to review um, some of the major aspects of observing with uh, with the MSA, um, and I'll note that um, I could go into a lot more detail and take hours and hours to cover these topics. And hopefully, in the future, we'll have uh, more public talks to delve into more detail with some of these things. Uh, and in fact, our WebEx moderator Diane Caracla will be doing that for the um, MSA planning tool um, in a couple of months. So just to get started, um, it's not advancing. There we go. Um, so many of you may have seen an uh, introductory talk that uh, Pierre Ferry, the uh, instrument uh, PI at ESA, gave uh, back in March, sort of an overview of all the capabilities of nurse spec. So I thought I'd just start off with one of the slides that he showed. Um, showing some of the high-level uh, science goals of JWST, the mission um, um, itself in general. Uh, and for, for NERSPEC in particular, one of our uh, high-level science goals is to obtain multi-object spectroscopy at low, medium uh, re spectral resolution across a wide field of view. And so that's the aspect of the instrument that I'll be uh, uh, talking about today. Um, and that's how we've achieved that capability by uh, using the micro shutter assembly. So uh, just to remind you, um, the MSA is just uh, one component of the instrument. We have three main modes. Multi-object spectroscopy using the MSA is one of them. The others are also um, an IFU uh, for spatially resolved spectroscopy. Um, and then also uh, 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 high contrast single object spectroscopy. Uh, using um, a set of fixed slits, uh, and in particular, that's uh, important for um, uh, exoplanet uh, time series observations. Uh, but in this talk, of course, I'll be focusing um, on the uh, uh, MOS mode. So just a quick overview of NERSPEC design, following the light path uh, through the system, uh, just so that you're familiar with the main components. Uh, light goes from the telescope uh, mirror uh, through the pickoff mirror and into the instrument. Uh, it passes by a set of optics, uh, including the four optics, which passes the light um, through a filter wheel. Uh, and it can select different uh, settings of the filter wheel in combination with the grading wheel to get the desired uh, spectral coverage and resolution. Um, the micro shutter array is located here uh, in the uh, optical path. That's uh, a focal plane where the light is focused onto um, either at the MSA or the IFU or the fixed slits, again, depending on which mode um, is being used. Uh, then the light is collimated from there um, and then uh, glances onto the grading wheel, again, the setting uh, appropriate for whichever spectral uh, configuration you want. <clears throat> and then finally, it's imaged onto the focal plane array, we have two detectors butted up against each other with the spectra being dispersed onto, <coughs> excuse me, one or both um, of those arrays. So the spectral configurations, as I said, um, we use a combination of uh, filter wheel and grading wheel settings to give um, uh, a range of options for both spectral coverage and spectral resolution. This figure here <coughs> shows uh, the settings um, I don't know if I can I point at this. Can you see my? Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. So uh, the low spectral resolution setting is using a prism, and so there you get complete coverage from 0.6 to 5.3 microns um, in one in one go. Low resolution are of about 100, although the resolution does vary um, depending on the wavelength. You can see down here in this figure, barely here at the bottom is the uh, um, resolution curve uh, for in green for the prism across the full wavelength range. And then we have a set of gratings, uh, uh, three gratings, again, in combination with a, a total of four different filter settings uh, to get these four uh, um, wavelength ranges here. So using 
um, basically uh, settings between 0.7 and 1.2 microns, 1 and 1.8 microns, 1.7 and 3.1, and 2.9 to 5.2 microns. So to cover the full range possible with NERSPEC, you need, with, uh, for the gradings, you would need a total of four settings to achieve these. And there are two <clears throat> different gradings uh, providing resolutions of either R of roughly 1,000, shown here on this plot in the, with the purple lines. So R 1,000 is the average resolution. Um, and then also a higher resolution of um, uh, R of about 2,700 uh, for these, um, uh, again, for the same, same wavelength settings. So all of these uh, different configurations are possible um, for any uh, uh, NERSPEC mode, including um, the MSA. Uh, uh, James, mode. let me ask you something. <coughs> Excuse me. The bandpass of uh, uh, the bandpasses are limited by the filters or by something in the grating? Um, it's a uh, well, a combination of both. Um, the short wavelength and um, is mainly um, uh, the response of the filter cutting on. These are these are our long pass filters, so it cuts off light basically to <coughs> eliminate uh, second order overlap. So the, uh, the, the long wavelength end is determined either by the um, uh, uh, the throughput of the gratings, or in the case of the long wavelength end, it's the detector cutoff. Okay, so you can have a 1.7 to 3.1 low resolution in theory, if you put the filter in the sense uh, of... Uh, well, uh, we don't allow that. You don't allow that, but no. the hardware no, but is, that is there is, yeah. conceivable. Yes, okay. yes, yeah. There, we, we use com sort of non-standard combinations like that for calibration, but um, right. science users won't have, at least initially, won't have that. Right, right. It just will make spectra shorter, Yeah. Right. which right. may add to the multiplexing. Right. Okay, so that's sort of a top-level overview of the instrument in general. Now let's go on to the MSA uh, itself. Um, I'll note that um, NERSPEC is a, a very much an international collaboration. Uh, many different European countries responsible for constructing and testing uh, many of the parts of the instrument. Um, but in particular, the MSA itself, the, the micro shutter subsystem, was uh, <coughs> developed and constructed uh, by NASA at, uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center. They were the one that provided the hardware that went into the instrument uh, for that. So um, the MSA itself, um, basically the idea is to use um, MEMS technology, independently um, uh, uh, movable small micro shutters um, to, to configure a slit mask and obtain spectroscopy on the sky using slits uh, for multiple objects um, in this way. And so the basic design <clears throat> is a grid of, um, of small micro shutters, again, each independently operable. Here's sort of an uh, uh, electron micrograph of a small area of one of these um, arrays. You can see these regular pattern um, of uh, uh, what we call the egg crate uh, structure. And if I zoom in even more, you can actually see here at the bottom are these sort of paddle-like um, um, uh, uh, components. These, those are the actual doors that can be opened and closed um, to provide. Um, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. My throat is dry today. <clears throat> um, so each of these can be uh, opened and closed as needed to provide um, slits to observe objects on the sky. So, for example, um, one of our sort of default observing strategies is to open. Uh, shutters in a three shutter, what we call slitlet pattern, um, where uh, a target on the sky is put into one of these three shutters. The other two are open uh, basically for a measurement of background, and then the source is knotted um, between each of these three shutters. So three exposures with the source in each of these three um, open shutters in the slitlet, and then the data get processed uh, um, from there. And I'll get into the more of the details of how the data are processed later on. Uh, but this is technology basically gives us a way of, of creating these uh, slits um, uh, in space. So the, um, the subsystem itself is cons uh, constructed of four separate, uh, more or less identical arrays that we call quadrants, 
Each of the quadrants uh, is an array of 365 by 171 shutters. Again, each independently operable. The size of each shutter on the sky for the full shutter pit, so in, including the, the bars in between the, um, the actual shutter doors themselves, is uh, 0.26 by 0.52 arc seconds. <clears throat> now, the actual area open to sky when, when the shutter doors are open is smaller than that. It's 0.2 by 0.46 uh, arc seconds. And then you can mu open multiple ones of those to, uh, to form slits <coughs> on the sky, although the whole area is not open because the uh, bars in between each shutter uh, still block some of the light. So we actually configured the MSA using a, mo a movable magnet arm. And so what happens is software on the ground uh, actually, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, creates the configuration of which shutters should be opened um, for a science observation. That information is downloaded uh, or uploaded uh, onto the spacecraft. And when an observation is ready to execute, voltages are applied to the entire array at first, and then the magnet arm is swept uh, in one direction from the primary park position uh, located down here, all the way up to the secondary park, opening all of the shutters. Um, and then uh, the shutters that are actually intended to be left open for observations um, are um, left with voltage. Everything else, the voltage is uh, cut off. Magnet arm is swept back, back to the uh, primary park position, and that closes all the shutters that are meant to be closed, and then all, only the shutters meant to be open for observations are open, and then it, the instrument is then configured for science observations. So um, I also I, I should mention here, this shows um, the outline of the, the four array quadrants here. Um, this is in sort of the instrument view where the optical bench of the instrument is down at the bottom of the page. Um, so again, here's the primary part position where the magnet arm stays uh, normally. There's an, uh, a small tab attached to the magnet arm that is intended to block the IFU so that when we observe um, with the MSA, since both of those modes share the same detector area, we can only use one at a time. So this blocks the, I, the IFU when the MSA is in use. When we want to use the IFU, the magnet arm moves um, to this IFU open position here, which allows light to go through um, the IFU. And then also you can see here the different apertures uh, that are the fixed slit, the five fixed slits that are physically cut out of this bar separating um, the quadrants here. And those are used for the fixed slit spectroscopy that I, I won't be talking about. So that's sort of the hardware view. Um, there's a, a, an image here of the um, IFU entrance aperture uh, where it's um, uh, in the open position. So now if I go and show you what actually things look like um, on the, uh, the detector view, how the data that you'll actually get from the spacecraft will look, it's actually rotated um, from the instrument view here. Uh, and, in this and then here, <clears throat> this shows the, um, basically where the quadrants would be imaged onto the detectors um, uh, using sort of just, a, just imaging without a disperser in the, um, in the optical path. And again, showing you all of the different apertures and where the virtual slits for the IFU would be imaged on the detector here. So these are the areas covered by the quadrants. As you can see here, one important thing to note, this will come up again later on in several places. Uh, the two detectors have a small gap here. Um, the it's about, detectors are in green. And, yeah, sorry, the detectors are, are, are displayed here in green. So there's a gap of about 18 arc seconds between here. That, will result in some uh, loss of data in certain circumstances. Um, certain wavelength ranges uh, will not be covered because they'll fall into this gap. That's an important part of planning and also an important part of calibration. I'll come back to that a little bit later. The total field of view um, of, uh, of the instrument, all, all four quadrants covers about 3.4 by 3.6 arc minutes. Uh, not contiguous, of course, because there are, is, are these regions in between the quadrants that are blocked to light uh, on the sky, except for the fixed slits. There will always be light going, whether it's sky background or actual source, it's going through the fixed slits. Uh, but those are imaged onto a the detector that is not overlapping with any of the data from the MSA, so it's okay to have those two uh, simultaneously. 
and then the data in this uh, orientation, the dispersion direction of dispersed data on the detectors is moving in this way. And I'll show you some examples of that uh, later on. So uh, just to show, um, the MSA is not a perfect beast. Um, it has uh, some um, uh, cosmetic features <laughs> uh, where some of, not all of the, of the uh, apertures are operable. This shows the operability map where all of the shutters that are uh, uh, failed closed um, are shown in black. So all the light areas are all of the operable shutters. It looks a lot worse than it really is. Remember, this is a total of almost a quarter of a million shutters um, through all four of these quadrants. And there's, so we're way zoomed out. Um, but nevertheless, there are certainly um, some fraction of the shutters that uh, are not operable. And we take that into account when we plan the observations, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, this is just a note that this is the kind of thing that you'll see um, <coughs> uh, in the data. There are also um, a little more extreme are failed open shutters. Thankfully, we have a lot fewer of those. I think there's about 19 of these, uh, mostly in the top two quadrants in this orientation view. Those are a little more insidious because they're always open. They always let light through, and <coughs> light it gets dispersed onto the detectors. Um, in most cases, it would probably just be low-level sky, but that still could be an issue um, with confusion and contamination of science sources. And so the planning tool takes that into account when, uh, when uh, planning observations about which shutters to open um, on science targets so that we take this into account. But nevertheless, these are here. They may evolve with time, um, although for the most part, these are uh, the arrays that we're using in flight um, are reasonably stable. There are some shutters which um, open, uh, are failed open for a time and then um, start working again. So there is some variability and we will keep track of those uh, throughout the mission uh, regularly. Another point that I want to note is that um, uh, the shutters are not, don't have an infinite contrast, though they do have a very large contrast. The ratio um, of light um, that uh, if you take an exposure, um, say, of an internal lamp, which actually this shows with the MSA all closed, some of that light actually does leak through mainly because um, there, there are a very small gaps around each of the shutter doors. So a little bit of light gets through. Typical contrast values are, are say, um, it measure in the tens of thousands. I think 30,000 is sort of a typical uh, value. So in most cases, <clears throat> you probably won't have to worry so much about any of this um, imprint of sources behind closed shutters. But if you're working in regions with very uh, bright backgrounds, looking at very faint point sources, or fields with very dense fields with many uh, very, very bright uh, sources in them, um, you, can, you can see some signal uh, bleed through even closed shutters. Um, that's just something, uh, again, to be aware of. Um, I should note that this figure is highly exaggerated. <laughs> this is a very extreme case of using very bright illumination um, with the internal uh, flat field lamp. So this is sort of an extreme case. Typical data won't, uh, won't look like this. So, um, so again, so the, in a nutshell, the MSA provides a, a really great way of of uh, obtaining multi-object spectroscopy. Here's an example of the four quadrants on top of a field of, uh, that I'm sure is going to be very popular with JWST, the Tarantula Nebula, and HST. It's a very powerful capability of obtaining spectra in the near infrared of many, many sources um, um, uh, in a relatively short amount of time. Here's an example of one of the uh, primary use cases um, for, uh, for this mode, that's uh, uh, deep cosmological fields. This is an image, I think, of, um, of the Hubble Deep Field showing a range of sources. Here is what it looks like when you place um, the four MSA quadrants on top of that field. So the field of view is well matched to that particular image here. <clears throat> this is actually an example of something that was run through the planning tool. The source is in red, which you probably can't see so well, but there, um, there's a bunch of sources surrounded by red circles. Those are, are objects that have been selected for this particular example. Um, where uh, shutters will be opened on them for an observation with one MSA configuration. So the sources span uh, all four quadrants across this field. 
Um, here's what it would look like um, with um, without considering any of the uh, failed shutters. Um, only the shutters opened in these three this three shutter slitted configuration on each of the sources. It's hard to tell this zoom that it's three shutters, but it is for each one all over here. Here's a zoom in showing you these slitlets. The source um, in the, these this case is in the middle of the three shutters in each um, in each slit here. It's shown in blue here. <clears throat> when the data are actually taken with dispersor, uh, um, this is what it will look like um, imaged onto the detector. So again, the, the, the outline of the MSA quadrant is shown in here. Here are the two detectors in the focal plane. And then these uh, rainbow spectra are, are sort of a depiction of what the spectra would look like imaged onto the detector for these open shutters in this particular case. Uh, and yeah, for this case, this is R100 using the prism, so it's very short. Uh, spectra, uh, low resolution. Here is the same case um, using the R of 1000 uh, gratings. Uh, well, one of the gratings, I don't know which one is depicted here. And here you can see uh, very clearly what I mentioned before, um, that uh, a range of the spectra um, that fall across the detector gap, you don't get to recover that. You, you miss that information in those wavelength ranges. Um, we will be offering tools to help uh, users um, determine uh, for a given configuration which shutters are open, it will tell you uh, the range of wavelengths that you would miss um, in a case like this so that you can plan ahead, although we don't have a capability in the tool to specifically plan for a particular wavelength range at, at this point. The red, the red dots in there, is that the zero order location? The red dot is the zeroth order um, spectra, yes, mm -hmm. that's right. So you will see that depending on where in the field of view the uh, given uh, source is located. We'll talk about the color. <clears throat> oh yes, and another thing to note <clears throat> is um, the uh, some of the spectra will fall off of the edge of the detector and the other other range, so you will, may miss in some cases the uh, red end um, of the spectra as well. That, and that's even more of a case here with the highest resolution grading. Uh, an example here, you can see that more clearly. Um, so the exact wavelength range you get is determined for um, MSA observations, not just by the, the uh, uh, disperser grading filter combination you use, but also where it's located in the field of view. So your targets, and they're selected for quadrants one and two primarily? Um, so no, they're all. It's all. It's all yeah, okay. you can see um, these little, there's little no, black the, oh. lines that shows the location okay. of the shutter that corresponds to each, okay. uh, each spectrum. So they're this, this, in this particular case, they're evenly distributed. Okay. <clears throat> so one last thing um, about uh, operations before I move on. Uh, an important aspect of observing with, um, uh, with the MSA is target acquisition. Uh, this is especially important if flux calibration is important to you and, and to your science. You need to be able to make sure that all of your science targets are centered as well as possible within um, their respective shutters. And in order to, to make sure that the targeting is as accurate as possible, we have to go through this target acquisition procedure. The um, blind pointing of the telescope um, is, is not going to be good enough. Um, unless you really don't care about flux calibration, um, it's not going to be good enough for most science cases. So we have this procedure um, uh, to do that using reference stars that have to be selected from the same sample as the science targets, from the same catalog. They need to have the same astrometric um, reference point um, so that we can observe the reference stars and obtain um, the target acquisition determined the offsets that the telescope need to be moved to place all the science sources where they were planned to be using um, the planner. I don't really have time to get into this in detail, but I left some text here on the process um, that is used. I just want to emphasize here, again, <clears throat> reference stars and science targets should be from the same catalog. And if flux calibration is important to you, the astrometric accuracy of the catalog is very important. And I'll get back to that in a couple of slides. So now to move on um, for observation planning, um, and again, I'll note um, uh, Diane Karakla will be giving a public lecture um, at the end of February, going into this in a lot more uh, detail. I don't have time to, to, I just barely will scratch the surface for this, um, but um, it can easily fill an hour um, just to describe in detail the aspects 
um, of the planning tool and, and also to give a demonstration of how, of how it works. But this is a very important piece of designing uh, MSA observations. So um, some of the, the challenges involved with planning um, that are, are unique to this mode, the MSA is a fixed grid, as, I, as I've already described. Um, so there are uh, the, the open shutters, but when you open these slitlets, um, they still have the shutter bars in between that vignette light from the sources. So that has to be taken into account in how you position this fixed grid on um, your um, uh, region of interest to find uh, basically the pointing that will give you, for example, the most number of targets in a, in a single pointing. There's also a gap, as I mentioned, between the two detectors. Um, so that uh, will cause um, gaps in wavelength coverage in some cases. Uh, there's an aspect of trying to uh, dithers, uh, both to recover the lost information from the detector gap, also to help improve um, sampling at different regions on the detectors to help, uh, help mitigate um, detector um, bad pixels and that sort of thing. Um, and then also just basically accumulating enough signal uh, by moving targets around. So in order to account for dithers, um, that it gets quite complicated to do that uh, in this particular case. <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned, the MSA has a number of failed shutters, uh, failed closed, failed opens. Those also have to be taken into account um, and those do evolve. And so again, that has to be uh, included in planning uh, it, what kinds of configurations need to be opened um, for the best possible uh, science uh, data. And then accurate source positions and in, in figuring out which shutters a source might be in, we have to have very accurate knowledge um, of the uh, optical distortions of the instrument um, and all other effects related to that, such as velocity aberration. All of these things have to be taken into account. Um, and so that's why we've created uh, in APT uh, MSA planning tool, which accounts for all of these things uh, um, for you. And I invite you, here's a link here um, to the latest version of APT, including MPT. Uh, and if you're um, curious, please go ahead and, and, and try it out. So um, one important other thing to, to keep in mind for this is the timeline for MSA. Obviously, this is a little bit different than any of the other modes on JWST, we, we've um, tried to adhere to sort of a single stream proposal process, unlike HST, where a user will submit a proposal and essentially the entire program will be specified up front. Um, we can't really do that, strictly speaking, for the MSA because the um, actual configuration or set of configurations that are uh, selected for a given program depend on when the observation is scheduled because that determines, um, uh, among other things, what the roll angle or uh, possible range of roll angles is going to be. <clears throat> and so for that reason, uh, for MSA, we basically have two, uh, sort of a two-step process. The initial proposal submission, um, which will basically um, allow you to specify uh, instrument configuration like which gratings, uh, grading filter combinations you want, um, uh, which regions of the sky you want to look at, and then an estimate of a total exposure time um, um, that you might have for your entire program. If the pr proposal is accepted, then at some point you will have to then go through, you will be assigned an orient um, by the long range uh, planner. Um, so unless you have a specific science case to constrain the orient, um, you basically are going are to have to wait until uh, you get an orient assigned before you can then go ahead and plan your observations with the, plan, uh, with the planning tool. Um, so that's sort of, um, so you'll have this window of opportunity um, after um, the uh, proposal uh, acceptance um, for you to design the final program that will then be uploaded for, um, for execution. And so again, MPT, um, uh, you'll be using uh, to do that, both, both um, uh, parts of, of this process. So just um, a little bit um, uh, of detail on what the plan tool involves. There's a number of things that you can select uh, to specify your observation within the planning tool. I'm just going to touch on a few, a few of these. <coughs> One thing is the uh, shutter margin. Um, so this basically uh, will can tell the planning tool when it when it tries to estimate which uh, point sky pointing and which shutters to open, 
This tells it where the sources need to be within um, each of their shutters. And there's a range of constraints that you can apply, uh, ranging from uh, completely unconstrained, which um, basically can put a target anywhere within the shutter, including behind the uh, bars and between the open areas. Um, then there's a, a, a then an increasing levels of uh, margins. There's the restricted to just the open shutter area, so no sources will be behind a bar. They can be anywhere within the open area. And then three uh, different ranges of, of tightening the constraint up to uh, this tightly constrained region here. What this does is basically um, gives you some flexibility in the, the less constraint you have. Um, the uh, larger range of potential pointings uh, uh, that you can get for uh, a given um, observation. Uh, but if, in particular, if flux calibration is important to you, uh, you probably want to go for the more tightly constrained option here. This plot here shows basically as a function of wavelength um, the estimated worst case uh, throughput <coughs> uh, through the MSA for these different ranges of, of, of constraints. Um, so for unconstrained, in the worst case, the sources behind the MSA bar, uh, very little light um, uh, uh, <clears throat> actually gets through. And then in the most <laughs> constrained case, uh, worst case scenario, the outer part of this region, you get something like um, 70 to 80 percent um, of the light actually gets through. You use a different constraint for each aperture? observation? No, um, these are applied to all the aperture all, all of the targets that that um, are, are get into shutters, assigned shutters, or all have the same constraint. <clears throat> so this also has implications um, for target acquisition and the accuracy, astrometric accuracy of the source code that you use as input into the planning tool. Um, and so just to go back to um, this, here's a table that Diane uh, actually made where sort of a range of different accuracy um, of your input catalog, what that does to the target ac acquisition accuracy, and how that translates to ultimately the accuracy of the flux calibration. So in the optimal case, for example, if you use either HST imaging or near cam pre-imaging, um, you should get a catalog astrometric accuracy of, of, on, of order five milliarc seconds, which will translate uh, through in the standard T, TA process an accuracy of uh, 20 milliarc seconds or less. That's the final positional uncertainty of a source within its shutter. Um, okay, so that's a, a much a very small fraction of the total area of a shutter, of course, about, about a tenth of a shutter width. If flux calibration isn't so important to you, you can, where well, there is the option of using relaxed constraints. For example, if you're using a catalog with um, less astrometric accuracy, sort of the, on the order of 40 milliarc seconds or less, that translates to a higher, a, a lower TA accuracy. Um, again, that so that will affect the final positioning uh, or where your source is actually known to be within its shutter, which has effects um, on the flux calibration again. And then, um, uh, and then this also uh, depends on the set of reference stars that you're using for the TA process um, as well. And just as I said, um, this affects the flux calibration. This is shown, um, or sorry, th this here is something that Tracy Beck um, did a study of what actually happens in terms of how the astrometric accuracy of the input catalog it relates to um, the uh, target acquisition accuracy for MSA target acquisition. You can see here, there's a, almost a linear trend here with these very low sort of five to 10 milliarc second accuracy that we expect to have for, uh, from near cam will translate in less than, to less than 20 milliarc seconds accuracy in the TA process. Um, and then of course that gets higher as you go to higher um, catalog accuracies here. So again, it really depends on what kinds of science you're doing to uh, will determine how good a, a, a positional astrometric accuracies you really need with your input catalog. And then this slide here shows um, how the astrometric accuracy translates to the uncertainty in the flux calibration itself. So in the best case, using HST or near cam pre-imaging, um, for this range of, of from unconstrained to tightly constrained um, uh, settings in the planning tool will yield this level of uncertainty 
um, in the um, the flux calibration, basically the uh, or the component of the flux calibration that is given to um, slip loss, uh, uns uncertainty in the slip loss, basically. Um, so here, with the best accuracies, you're constrained to um, in the range of maybe 10% or so uncertainty, and that goes up much higher for um, much lower astrometric accuracy. So keep that in mind when you're planning your observations. If flux calibration is important, you really need to stick with HST or near-cam pre-imaging um, to get your catalogs. Uh, James, just to <coughs> be clear, this is uh, 10 milliard seconds, say, of relative precision within yes. the field is uh, with respect to the stars that you put in the FGS. Uh, I mean, what is, uh, uh, what well, type of... Well, th this particular plot is, this is the astrometric accuracy of, uh, well, let's see, this is of the catalog itself. So the relative astrometry mm -hmm. for your catalog in your internal field. Yes. And near cam right. is 32 <clears throat> milliard second per pixel, so 10 would be a third of a pixel, mm -hmm. which is pretty generous. We should do much right. better. <clears throat> right. Right. Okay. So we're expecting we something have... like 5 milliard second relative ac astrometric accuracy from near cam. <coughs> right. Without, that's about right. With, that's, that's a sixth of a pixel. It's sort of <laughs> yeah. too easy. Yeah. That's, right. Yeah. Okay. Right. right. Very easy. Right. Yeah. All of this is it's the relative astrometry that matters. The absolute right. doesn't matter because the, the target access process itself will take out any, yes. any right. errors right. Right. Um, for that. <clears throat> okay, so getting back um, to the, the planning tool itself, another aspect um, that is selectable here is what kinds of dither patterns you want to use. There's a couple of different uh, 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 possibilities you can select from uh, different patterns. One is a fixed dither pattern. So this will take one configuration where you have, for example, um, as shown here, um, this these in green here, the three shutters and a slit lip that's got open messed, on each target. You got messed up a little bit, but yeah, the diagram, but that's okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <like awesome. clears throat> so we'll take configuration where you have these three shutters that's open on each target. And then that gets translated by a fixed number of shutters in uh, either the, the, the spatial direction, which here is vertical, or the dispersion direction, which here is uh, horizontal here, and allow you to move that around, uh, but with a fixed spacing between them. Um, there's also an option uh, for flexible dithers, which instead of specifying specific uh, shifts um, in the where the, where the slitlets are opened. This is just left basically as a, a free parameter, and the tool will determine, given some uh, rough constraints, um, uh, which and, and number of, of dither sets that you want. Um, um, will give you uh, basically a total set of uh, of configurations where the sources will be moved around uh, in within some um, region of influence that you select uh, in the planning tool. Uh, again, Diane will go into this in, in much more detail, but I just wanted to point out these are some of the um, aspects um, to think about um, and to select from um, um, in the planning tool. And then finally, <clears throat> the, the planning tool offers a range of assessment tools when you run through a case uh, one or more configurations for, um, say, a given uh, source catalog. It will then show you the results. This shows some examples. Here is the MSA shutter view showing um, uh, the, to all of the targets in the catalog are shown with the crosses here. And the ones that were actually um, uh, placed into open shutters are shown as the uh, um, solid circles here. But I forget what the green and the blue. Green means primary, green means uh, the primary <coughs> candidate list. Okay. Blue means filler, right. and black means contaminants that were right. picked up. Right. The same so stuff. there's a range of of source criterion that you can specify. Primary targets meaning basically the ones that you're most interested in. Um, that's the one that will drive. That are basically the drivers for. Um, the, how the tool determines which shutters to open and which which pointing to point at uh, for a given uh, exposure. 
Um, and then fillers are basically sources that are added in after that pointing is determined and, and basically where any free shutters are open onto those sources. And contaminants are other sources in the catalog that happen to lie within a planned open, uh, open shutter. And then here on the right shows a collapsed shutter view, basically taking all of these green and, and blue sources and over plotting them onto a single shutter, showing you where all of them lie uh, relative to the shutter area. And so in this case, this is uh, one of the um, sort of intermediate constrained um, um, uh, margins here. You can see all the sources lie within this dashed box here just to kind of give you an idea of how things are distributed um, uh, in their shutters. <clears throat> so these are some of the aspects that you will see when, when running the tool. Okay, so that's the tool. Uh, in the, my last uh, 10 minutes or so, um, I'll try to run through uh, relatively quickly um, the third aspect, uh, which is data calibration, um, which as you might suspect is um, a little bit complicated. Um, so just to set the stage, here is an example of uh, sort of a zoom in of what a typical um, uh, MSA configuration uh, might look like. Again, this is this sort of three shutter slitlet case where the target is in, in this case, the middle shutter shown in red and then the green open shutters um, um, on the two sides of that are basically open to sky to provide you a, a measure of sky. And in this particular case, you are able to have the source be knotted into each of the three shutters in turn. So you obtain three exposures where the, uh, each of the targets is moved into the three shutters in, in each of their slitlets. So you obtain three exposures um, 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 of data that then need to get um, calibrated. Here's an example of what uh, uh, some data might look like. This is a simulation uh, provided by uh, Pierre Ferwi at ESA using the instrument simulator. Um, this shows um, uh, a spectroscopic uh, uh, a deep galaxy field using the, the uh, prism. Um, so again, this is the low, low spectral resolution. You can see the relatively short spectra on the detector. Um, and this actually includes, this is for a three shutter slitlet configuration. So it's hard to see it at this level of zoom, but this actually includes um, a middle shutter with the object itself and then two shutters on either side with the sky. Um, and then also you can see here uh, light going through the fixed slits um, shown here in between the, uh, the quadrants here. So this is sort of an example of what the data might look like for the two detectors, um, sort of the raw uh, unprocessed uh, data. Here's a zoom in of that particular case showing again, now you can see more clearly um, the target spectra and then the background spectra on either side of it here. So what we need to do as far as the calibration pilot is concerned is first find where these spectra are on the detector, extract them, calibrate the pixels, obtain all the information that we need, the wavelength solution, the flux calibration, all of that uh, for each of these um, spectra in turn. So there's a number of challenges that are involved um, in trying to do that. One, the location of the spectra on the detectors depends on the source location of the field of view, basically which shutter you open um, on, on your targets, depends on which uh, grading uh, filter, which is a grading filter uh, combination that you've used. Uh, another thing to note is that the, um, the spectra are curved. You may have noticed in some of the earlier um, uh, sort of um, cartoons that I showed the spectra, you could see a, a pronounced curvature across the entire field of view of the two detectors. Um, that is due to the fact that this is a wide field instrument. Mm -hmm. There are distortions in the uh, camera um, that basically cause mm -hmm. the spectra to be curved. Mm -hmm. And also uh, lines of constant wavelength are tilted. They're not aligned exactly with the detector pixels. There's a tilt and that tilt changes depending on the wavelength. Um, so all of that needs to be taken into account when trying to extract the spectra. And then the final piece um, and sort of the kicker um, is that the uh, grading wheel, um, the repositioning of the grading wheel is not fully repeatable. So what happens is if we move the grading wheel we, uh, from one position, say the G140H setting, rotate it, go to some other setting, make an observation, then go back to G140H, um, it won't go back to the exact same place. And that 
basically results in the spectra shifting slightly on the detector. It's not a huge effect. Um, uh, it's typically maybe a, a, a pixel or two, a few pixels at, at the most. Nevertheless, it's enough that we have to take that into account when identifying the location of the spectra and doing the calibrations. Uh, luckily, um, we have um, sensors attached to the grading wheel um, that are very well calibrated, and we can use this, the sensor voltage readings, which we get in telemetry, and then we can use that to determine um, the, uh, the uh, magnitude of the shift of the spectra that this plot here shows that calibration, the sensor voltage versus the shift in pixels of the location of the spectra. So it's very well calibrated, so that's very good. We can actually use that information um, to help within the calibration process. Nevertheless, I'll, taking all of these various effects and other effects that I haven't mentioned into account, uh, we need something robust in order for us to be able to do the spectral extraction and calibration. And the uh, strategy that we've chosen to adopt <clears throat> is using a parametric model of the instrument um, in order to perform these um, uh, calibrations. And what this does, basically, this is uh, an optical uh, a parametric model of all the components in the instrument, all of the optics, the optical path, and each of the different components uh, the filter wheel, um, the apertures in the shutter uh, uh, plane, uh, the grading wheel, and the detector itself. All of these things have been parameterized uh, using um, uh, this um, model based on the instrument performance simulator um, that ESA uses to generate simulated data. Um, and this model is uh, it uses a large amount of ground test data in order to calibrate um, all of the different parameters here and allows us to reproduce uh, the data that we have obtained already to very, very good accuracy. Um, and that's mainly driven by the wavelength calibration accuracy. Um, and the model does uh, much better than that by factors of, of two or three. Um, so um, very accurately, we can uh, basically use this model to determine <clears throat> a given source with a given position on the sky what that translates to in terms of the location of its spectrum on the detectors. And so we use this model in order to do that. And so here, <clears throat> basically, again, using this sort of as a cartoon description, the simulation here, using the model, we find um, for each target, each science source that was observed in, in a particular exposure, we use the model to determine where the spectrum is located in 2D space on the detector, physically extract those pixels and then do all of the remaining calibrations uh, with each of these, what we call 2D sub-windows um, for each of these targets. Um, and I should say for uh, <clears throat> the MSA case, the extraction includes the entire slitlet, not just the, sh the uh, shutter with the target, but also its associated background shutters and slitlet. Okay, thanks. Um, so here's a flow chart. I won't go into this into great detail, but this is sort of the level of processing that is done <clears throat> um, uh, for spectral data. Uh, this is uh, for the MSA mode um, itself, showing you where the model comes into play, all of the parameters that are involved in um, feeding information to the model in order for it to determine where the spectra are and how to extract it. <clears throat> and then once the spectra, each of these 2D subwindows are extracted at this step here, we then go through a number of steps uh, to fully calibrate the data, including flat field and throughput correction, uh, path loss correction, um, and then the final spectral products, um, which are given here. Um, one thing I'll note, this shows you the basic processing for um, an exposure level calibration. We provide um, a rectified 2D spectrum and a 1D extraction at the exposure level, but those are intended for quick look data products. Um, in the end, when we have multiple exposures, when a given science source is located in multiple exposures, we basically start with the fully calibrated 2D unrectified spectra um, and then throw all those together and do the re one instance of resampling and rectification before coming up with the final combined spectral product. Um, so this here just shows what basically a quick look products for exposure level um, uh, data. So in the interest of time, I have some information, some slides here um, I won't really, I don't have time to get into. Um, wavelength calibration, I'll note, um, we essentially use the instrument model 
to calculate on the fly the wavelength value specific to each pixel in these 2D spectra. Uh, the model itself is tuned, as I mentioned, using a large amount of ground-based and eventually in flight, we'll also use in-flight data uh, to fully calibrate that. The wavelength calibration piece of that we use uh, are, are calibrated mainly using um, internal lamps. We have two different sets of internal lamps, a, a so-called reference lamp, which uses an erbium filter shown here on the left, one example of this using the uh, G140H. Uh, this is a set of uh, a small number of uh, absorption lines that we can use, are particularly useful for monitoring um, the zero point of the wavelength calibration. And then we have a set of uh, so-called line lamps, which are um, uh, basically using something like a, a, a Fabry-Perot interference uh, filters to, to create these sort of uh, broad uh, emission line-like features that we can use um, as a monitor of the dispersion solution for each of these cases. So all these kinds of data are obtained um, for many different shutters um, in, in the MSA to help calibrate the model. Um, uh, and then we'll also be checking in flight using on sky emission line sources as well, just as a, a double check that we've got the solution correct. Background subtraction, there's a number of ways we can do this. I won't really get in, into that. I can go back to that if people are interested. Um, flat field throughput correction, again, is a, a, a complicated in the MSA case because we have many, um, a large field of view, so we have to take that into account. Um, as well as just the normal um, uh, issues of, of flat. So the flat field is not just what you typically think of as being uh, sort of the pixel to pixel variations of the detector, but it also includes uh, full throughput of the instrument through its various um, uh, optical paths. Um, again, I can go back to that if people are, are interested. Uh, path loss correction, this shows an example of the flux loss that you get uh, what, for a target when it's um, uh, not exactly centered in the middle of a shutter. This is for a three shutter slitlet. Um, so if a target is in any one of these shutters, if it's well centered, um, path loss correction relatively is, is there's no correction. Um, and then as a source gets closer to the edge, of course, more flux gets lost. A larger correction needs to be added in. This is a, another step um, in the pipeline uh, as well. Um, in the end, the final data products you can expect to get for each source include uh, the 2D unrectified spectra from each uh, separate exposure, um, a final combined rectified 2D spectrum, and a combined 1D spectrum as well. Um, the data formats, again, I don't have time to really get into this, but this is sort of the um, how things are packaged. One thing I'll note is that we actually, for each exposure, um, the uh, data are basically a, a combined, of course, with a, a, consists of a number of different science sources within a single FITS file. Um, at some point down through the pipeline, we actually reorganized that uh, to provide data with FITS extensions, um, all of the exposures for a single uh, science target. Uh, that way it's a little easier to organize the data for the pipeline and also for the user as well. And then all of those exposures for each source are then um, added together to provide the final combined uh, data product. Again, as I said, including the 1D and 2D products uh, for each target observed in a given program. Um, and then and the, I'll end here with some plots of um, the uh, source sensitivities um, that you can expect to achieve. Um, here, a um, little disclaimer that um, these are conservative estimates right now. They'll probably improve as time goes on. And uh, um, I encourage you to check out the exposure time calculator um, to get the uh, latest um, uh, and greatest estimates of what you can expect, uh, performance that you can expect to achieve. Um, and I'll end there and take any questions. Thank you. I can't see anything on the line right now. Question online? Yes, go ahead, man. <laughs> Blair, uh, so the, uh, the the closed shutters uh, figures you showed, in addition to just spots for, for closed shutters, had vertical lines and horizontal lines, and I didn't hear that you said, uh, let's see, page 13 or 17 with the examples. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I just wondered what was the full lines. 
Yes, I, you're right. I didn't I didn't mention that specifically. Um, so yeah, this show shows here. Um, actually, well, yeah, that's kind of. So uh, in that cases, uh, in those cases, basically what that's showing is um, there are some some shutters, uh, some shutter rows and columns where there are shorts, there are electrical shorts. And when that happens, we basically have to mask the entire row uh, or column. Um, and so what you're seeing there are those rows and columns that have been masked because of these uh, electrical shorts. So even though it may be localized to a given shutter because of the nature um, of, of the short, we basically have to just mask the whole the whole thing. So that's what you're seeing there um, are these uh, are these masked uh, uh, shorted rows and, and columns. Um, also, I'll note that there are some of these larger regions in here, like here. Um, uh, are, these, are these the older MSAs? That is the one? older MSA. Yeah, I think you have an, er, another one that's the. Let me, uh, let me go back. Yeah. The yeah. Pattern didn't there it is. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, yeah. These are the MSAs in flight. This is what, what's shown here. Um, so you can see there, yeah. So the smaller are basically single shutter, closed shutters, or clusters of, in some cases, some of the shutters were actually um, uh, physically sealed shut because they were failed open upon fabrication. Um, so that's also kind of um, shown in here. So uh, everything in black are all the shutters that are failed closed for whatever reason, either it's just stuck closed or um, the rows uh, have been masked, rows or columns have been masked out. And you said this has been pretty stable over time? Well, um, the failed failed close the failed open I think has been a little more stable failed closed have uh, evolved mm -hmm. over time um, they they have increased at certain points um, there was um, actually you can see some of these regions like up in here the more localized um, uh, regions with a lot of failed closed shutters a lot of that occurred after um, the acoustic test of the instrument. So if something with the acoustic test caused some of the shutters to get stuck closed. So I think the expectation is once we go on to orbit, um, the evolution will hopefully level off again. Uh -huh. do, do any failed sure. closed ones ever come back? Is there any? There are, uh, there are some that can be variable in that way, but uh, the vast majority of them, I think, essentially once they're stuck closed, they stay closed. I just want to mention that there, so there's a, um, a monitoring of the shorted rows and columns on in flight. Yes. But so for hard shorts, we can detect them and protect the MSA um, and then record those to our new, uh, flag those in our new uh, files, operability maps, but uh, or masks. Right. Um, but for sh <clears throat> other types of electrical shorts that might happen that are softer electrical shorts that, that may be intermittent even, we'll have to detect them from data and from people's data. And so we'll have to be looking at that, you know, periodically as well. Right. To look for any new well, opens and any new shorts. What would cause that kind of thing in an idea? Mm, just, you know, just transient little problems with connecting wires, I guess. I'm not really positive. <laughs> I, don't I, don't know. Know. I don't know. I just yeah, imagine it could happen. The shorts, but the, yeah, that can yeah. It, should, it shouldn't change yeah. very much. The shorts shouldn't change very much. Mm -hmm. The and failed we'll be, closed. Yeah, and we'll be monitoring the failed closed um, using, this is actually based on, on real data where we turn on the internal flat lamps uh, mm -hmm. and open all of the shutters, command open all the shutters. And so you can basically see that way all the shutters are stuck closed. You can easily identify uh, based on those exposures. And then vice versa with all the shutters commanded closed to find the failed opens. And so we'll be monitoring, obtaining that data periodically on orbit. Um, to monitor and see if things change. Where's the field stop shadow in this? So the so the field stop does cut off a little bit. Um, the MSA actually, the MSA quadrant extend a little bit further up, actually to the top of this figure here and down here. Um, but the field stop covers up a, a little bit of that. Okay. Do we get another image of this after the five? Because. Spacecraft's involved now, right? Um, I yeah, I think they'll be getting yeah. that uh, uh, well, during the launch. launch. Uh, yeah, in, at Johnson. <laughs> Is it yeah. done? Yeah. So, um, I have another question online. Would you get a minute? Let me ask one thing. These uh, you move the sources around because. Uh, 
you want to subtract the sky, <clears throat> uh, which means that uh, the threat, I mean, what's the, what's the main reason basically? It's because of bad pixel, because the model that you have is not good enough for the threat fielding uh, no, well, the, Centering and flux calibration. What's, what do you mean by... I mean this three, for example, this three pattern. Uh, so just the, the three shutter... The three shutter, no. for example. Why, why no, is that? No, it's to subtract the sky background, right? So, and the sky, um, so the sky taken on an adjacent slit uh, that you... Because you subtract the sky so each time the sky taken in the adjacent slits. For, well, so here, this shows a very cartoon example. If you have a two shutter slitlet where the source is one shutter background and the other, and you nod the source, you have two exposures. First one where the source is in this shutter and then the source mm -hmm. is down here. In this case, all we do is take the two exposures, the full frame exposures, subtract them from one another. And so you're left with the case here where you have a positive and negative image of the source here and the negative and positive here, but the background is identical here, right? You're subtracting the exact same thing. Um, and so, you know, in principle, um, if the back background isn't variable, it should all just subtract out. Um, there's another method um, of background subtraction, um, which gets a little bit more complicated. If you're moving, as say your source is in a, uh, using a different slit litter in a different shutter altogether than what the background is coming from, it gets more complicated. You can't just subtract them one to one like this because the shape of the spectra is different um, because of the op optical distortion, basically. The wavelengths are slightly different. The area coverage is different. So we have a different method for doing that. But in the standard nod case where you have the slit lit and you're nodding the source back and forth, we just subtract the exposures. Um, in their entirety. Another question on what? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, the, uh, do you know, uh, I'm trying to exactly figure out how to formulate my question. The, the 5 to 20 reference stars that are needed for a target act, uh, how, I guess, how well centered do they have to be in the slit list? I mean, how, or I guess my real question is how, uh, easy or difficult it would be to find five to 20 sources that are well centered uh, to do a target act for instance when you get to high galactic latitudes or something where maybe the, the point source density isn't isn't as high uh, is that has anyone studied that or is that going to be a problem um, well it could be but basically what happens is we take um, exposures with the MSA all open okay um, and we, there are two exposures taken with a small dither that's equivalent to half shutter width in between. So it doesn't matter. The, the reference stars don't have to be well centered um, because one way, at least they'll, they will be in at least one of the two exposures. So it's really a matter of the density of sources in the field that you're looking at. And you're right, it, 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 it can be very, it can be a little bit tricky. For example, um, the, um, the deep fields where there's very few point sources, right? Um, that can be a little bit more uh, dicey. I think, I think Tracy's done some simulations with that and she was able to get, um, I don't remember how many sources, yeah, but it was, yeah, it was sort of at the low end <laughs> yeah. of that range. Um, so that it's definitely, um, an issue, but there are there are different settings that you can use um, uh, that will allow you to use uh, different uh, brightness ranges. Um, so that may help. Um, uh, you know, if you try to look for fainter uh, targets, for example, you might need somewhat longer exposures for the, the, the target acquisition images. But um, you know, it uh, um, you might get so, uh, some more sources that way. I think but, the clear filter gives about the widest range of possibilities, at least for the deep Right, yeah, and there's right, a, yeah. And, yeah, there's a couple of different choices of filter you can use as well to help with that. So just to follow up there a little bit, so yeah. 5 to 20 is a pretty large range. Uh, how does the performance uh, for Target Act change when you're at the low end versus the high end of that number? Do you have a plot you on that? Do okay. you have a plot on what, uh, from Tracy on that? Oh, right, yes, there were different lines for yeah. this one, right? This one, yeah. Yeah, so these show um, the solid line is for five reference stars, the dashed line, long dashed line is for 20. 
So it's actually not that big of a range, it turns out. Excuse me, James. Can, I, I have still a question on the background subtraction. Uh -huh. yeah, can you go on the slide where you have the A minus B plus <clears throat> C, etc.? Uh, this one or the... No, this one. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. So the little uh, algebra down there. <laughs> right. So that's the case where you have three exposures. Okay, so, you so have two right, the now I understand. So B and C are the same as lit, but seen twice without the source. Exactly. So you don't mess right. up uh, the top slit with the middle Correct. and the bottom. You just Correct. repeat it. Okay, that's yep. clear. Yep. I, I, I missed that. Yep. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, another question I have. This near cam pre imaging may be demanding because you need to move the telescope, you pay overhead. Yeah. How much, uh, uh, what's the plan? Once you are there, uh, is the near spec user uh, intended to just get the 20 seconds shot of wide band to get the astrometry, or is going to inject a mini proposal to do a suite of filters? just to exploit the fact that we wasted all the time to get there. What yeah. is the plan? I, I feel like many people are going to make a little mini science program out of their <laughs> near cam images. That's what I, I, that's my sense of things. But I mean, yours? if you, it, yeah, mm -hmm. if you submit a proposal um, without near cam data and you say you need pre-imaging, you're going to be limited, I think, in, into uh, you know, what, what you're going to be able to get. It's going to be just for the purpose of pre-imaging, not right. going deep to find new sources or anything like that. But there uh, is an option to say it's done in a different uh, proposal and you could make that bigger. You can have a VC3 image. Right. That, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're yeah. fully, you're free to use whatever, and again, right. HST day with C3, and I think it's probably the best option, especially yeah. early on. If you don't want to wait to have to get the near cam data before mm -hmm. being able to plan your observations, use existing or get with C3 data, and that should provide the necessary uh, um, astrometric accuracy. Yeah, to reduce, really to reduce the slit losses, uh, to have better knowledge for the photometric accuracy, you really do need to be, I think we said 10 milliarc second uh, relative astrometric accuracy are below, and you can really only do that with some difficulty with <coughs> HST imaging. Um, but more easily, of course, with NearCam. So I think people are going to be are going to be driven if they're really interested in getting high photometric accuracy. They're going to be driven to be using pre-imaging right. NearCam. And uh, is this pre-imaging uh, in the like a, a, a page, and then you you cook in the APT a little NearCam? Uh, you just do a NearCam. You do a NearCam. You do a NearCam. Yeah. Same number yep. Yep. and yep. Uh, just uh, you indicate dash it. near cam dash Right, page. and in the MSA planning tool, you tell you tell the MSA planning tool for your near spec observations, which is the observation that's a, that it's linked to for the near cam pre imaging. Right. So right. that's that's how it's done. Right. Providing a tool for users to make the catalog from the pre imaging. Up to them I think the near cam pipeline should do a catalog uh, creation, yes. a catalog. That'll be yeah. accurate enough. To be... That's the yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, Jay so, Anderson yeah. says yes. yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so there won't be that much time required between the initial, the pre-imaging, or is there a limit? Yeah, we're, we're allowing for um, like a two-month oh, gap, or you know, like at least we we want to have a minimum of like six weeks. I think we have in there for the minimum um, gap that we need between you know near cam observations received and. Um, Planning of the phase two for the uh, for the near spec observations, for the follow up observations. But um, so it can be as small as six weeks, um, uh, but more likely two months or more. You know, but then then you you kind of push into another depending on the source's latitude. Right. You maybe target, push yeah, into the, another target visibility, visibility window. window. Wait yeah. another year, right? Uh -huh. That's right. Well, half a year anyway, right? A different, yeah. If the goal is only to refine the astrometry of a list of 96 sources, mm -hmm. we could cook this in three hours. Okay. That's good to know. <laughs> I mean, right? You get the images. There are going to be tools in your yeah. 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 And, <laughs> and get your, your better ast relative astrometry. Uh -huh.
Any other questions? I don't see anything online. Is all the pipeline uh, on GitHub? Uh, no, it's not publicly available yet. I, my understanding is it I, maybe by the end of next year. But it, I, think, I think build 7.1, uh, but I, I, I don't know how official that is. So I don't want to make any promises. But. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. And Thank again, you. if you think of any questions later on, definitely uh, contact any of us on the team. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much, everybody. We are stopping recording now. <laughs> Goodbye.